you, Ambassador Tai. Welcome back to the Ways and Means Committee hearing room, uh, where you spent a, a great deal of time. Um, I know you spoke about uh, a new story for trade, and, and I understand that you're taking a different approach, and certainly that's the prerogative of a, of a new administration. But I'm very concerned uh, that in this uh, so-called new age of trade, um, you know, two years into the presidency, that we've actually lost momentum on trade, and, and we've, I, I'm concerned we've lost ground. And this is all while China uh, is being very aggressive, um, economically and and building uh, their own uh, partnerships uh, while we are um, not as aggressive. I do ask unanimous consent uh, to include for the record a letter signed by 20 Ways and Means Committee members that I led uh, regarding the need for a strong proactive trade agenda. Ask for unanimous consent. Without objection. Thank you. Now, despite uh, calls for new trade promotion authority from Democrats and Republicans in both chambers, something I thought I would, I would never uh, say, but the administration has decided to attempt negotiation of new trade pacts without Congress. So this has already been touched on uh, briefly. But uh, since there seems to be some confusion, I, I do want to be clear uh, that trade agreements must be approved by Congress, and they should provide real market opportunities for U.S. producers, reduce tariffs, strengthen trade enforcement, and certainly reflect American law and values. I am glad to and honored to chair the, our committee's trade subcommittee. I cannot express strongly enough that the administration cannot just come up with new definitions of what a trade agreement is for some reason, and certainly not to give handouts for electric vehicles. And Congress will not, under any circumstance, relinquish our constitutionally mandated oversight of all trade matters. This concern, I believe, as we've heard already, is bipartisan and bicameral, and I hope you take the opportunity to address it today. To compete in the global marketplace, we need real enforceable trade agreements. The administration's preferred framework uh, approach, I am concerned, does not provide this. Would it be accurate to say, Ambassador, that the executive orders and frameworks like IPEF and APEP uh, could be dismantled when a new administration would take office? Well, um, Mr. Smith, if I can uh, back up just a little bit in terms okay, of- my, my time is limited, so I, I, yeah. I want to give you a chance to respond, but, but if you could be brief. Uh, let me put it this way. Um, if you take a look at the world economy and you look at our place in it, uh, after more than three years of um, pandemic and supply chain disruptions and uh, pressures on the energy market and uh, food insecurity because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you have to appreciate that we live in a very different world. We can't keep doing things the same way. I, I understand that. Those and things have brought us to right. this world. I, and I, I, and I appreciate that. So our that. engagement with the rest of the world is informed by not a desire, certainly not on my part, to bypass the Congress, but by a desire to adapt our trade policies to be more successful because they are responding to the world we're living in and not the world that we want to live in. Okay. Well, I, I worry that a, a framework might be considered successful although still ineffective in terms of establishing what we need to establish uh, in the world economy, especially uh, as uh, leaders in the world economy. But I, I think it's safe to say that if we want a stable environment to encourage investment and economic prosperity, that a congressionally approved trade agreement is what is, is necessary. But you know, take I, IPEF, for example. Uh, let's just say a member nation were to blatantly go against the science, as Mexico has done under USMCA, I mean, I fear that there would not be tools uh, for us to challenge what uh, another country would be doing, and, and especially, as the chairman noted, the glaringly uh, non-compliant ways that Mexico is, is uh, headed with corn, uh, especially when USMCA was, was approved and agreed upon by Mexico not long ago. So uh, changing gears just a little bit, let, let's focus on the TRIPS waivers. Uh, the, the, the notion that uh, our country would give away intellectual property uh, to other countries. In December, you directed the ITC to conduct a study on the proposed TRIPS waiver for COVID-related diagnostics and therapeutics. Uh, glaringly, I would say, uh, though, that uh, it, you did not seem to ask the ITC to perform any analysis on, on how such a waiver would actually impact our economy and, more importantly, uh, uh, our workers. 
Uh, can you uh, um, explain why that analysis was not asked of the ITC in, in the letter that you sent? Well, Congressman Smith, I think that there are aspects of our letter that get to those questions. So we could sit down and take a look at that letter. I think it's about a two-page long letter. Um, <clears throat> more specifically, the question that's been raised at the WTO is um, uh, the, inter, um, the interaction between intellectual property rules and where they've been set and uh, the ability of people who need to access them. And we thought that was a legitimate question. Uh, I got a lot of feedback from this committee and the, over in the Senate in terms of the process that we tried to run, and so I've asked the ITC to run their process, which has included a public hearing just a couple weeks ago. Okay, yeah, asking the stakeholders is one thing, but I, I would hope, that, as you point out, uh, that you're able to get an actual analysis on the impact to our economy and, like I said, even and more importantly, uh, the workers. Thank you. Mr. Thompson, you're recognized.